All right, thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you. Um, beyond the missionary position conjures up all sorts of ideas and images, broken backs and strained pelvises. But actually, this is a talk about a walk out of shame. Um, and when I say a walk, I don't mean a nice dignified stroll, more like a limp or a leap or a, a struggle. All in the right direction, though. Shame is a really interesting and um, a very powerful emotion. Incredibly uncomfortable, which is why it's so powerful, um, and really linked to survival. Um, because it's so unpleasant, most people have, you know, a bad thing about shame, but actually it can be very helpful. You can have a healthy relationship to shame and it can be really good for you. And I hope you'll see why. Um, shame is used to control behavior, basically. Uh, it's about boundaries. Um, when I think of boundaries, I, I don't mean just the physical boundaries of your body, your skin. I think more about energetic boundaries, um, like an aura or personal space, your proprioceptive boundary, if you want a scientific term for it. Um, it's about morals as well. And shame is a great way of organizing behavior. Um, we use it even in training animals, for instance, if you imagine a little puppy coming into the room, wagging its tail, looking all happy, and you say, Ooh, you bad dog. What have you done in the sitting room? And it will sink to the floor, ears down, tail down, and try and disappear between the floorboards. And if you then go and rub its nose in the dirt and say, Outside! If you do that often enough, you'll end up with a nice house-trained dog. And of course, the same technique is used for house-trained children. Um, and the area of our body that contains the most shame is the area where we have all our, our organs of elimination and also our organs of reproduction. And we are, it's very vital for us to know how to conduct ourselves in society, where to poop, how to poop, with whom to poop, all those kind of things make you socially acceptable and can very soon make you socially unacceptable. Similarly, uh, in relation to touch or sex, which is really about touch, who you touch, how you touch, when you touch, where you touch, is really important. Um, and certainly as a missionary, um, an ex-missionary, although still a man with a mission, <coughs> One of the things that I had to really pick up on was all those cues that made me an insider, at least understanding and empathetic, rather than a complete idiot and having to be forgiven for being an outsider. Um, <clears throat> so shame is uh, a very powerful way of controlling people in societies. And it's really important because we are social beings. We need to belong. Um, and so what, what shame is for, for most of us is that little voice which accuses or excuses, otherwise known as the conscience. And you can educate the conscience, and your conscience is educated by your society, your family, your culture. Um, the, the feeling behind shame, the sentiment behind shame, is whether you're worthy to belong. It's contempt. And that's why it's so uncomfortable, because then you're outside. Um, so, when I had my first sexual experience, age six or seven, I realized that I had joined the adult experience class, but I was now an outsider because shame, which was supposed to keep me in, now kept me out. I couldn't share my experience with my peers. I couldn't share my experience with anybody else because it would only ignite their shame. So now I was an outsider, although I was inside. Uh, and that's the two-edged sword of shame. Shortly after that, my family moved back to this country from Africa, and I had to learn all the social cues on how to be a good Englishman. Um, I had to learn that swearing, cheating, lying, stealing were not socially acceptable. Uh, they were where I came from. <laughs> And as you can see, I was disciplined and put in the black squad and shamed, and, um, and it worked. So here I am as a nice, well-behaved English gentleman. 
um, <clears throat> on the outside, that is. The other thing that happened to me at school was that I was abused. And I was abused at a point where I was trying to work out my sexuality. And so I was confused now, as well as being, again, an outsider, not able to share or talk, and not finding people who really understood or were sympathetic. People who suggested, you know, to a 16-year-old, um, well, you could always start a court case. Well, it's the last thing on your mind. Um, so when I left school, I was a prime candidate for salvation. I knew I was a sinner. I had a massive burden of guilt and shame. And guilt is to do with activities and actions. But the basic thing is shame. Shame, which people tend to think of, is that you're not worthy. Guilty is that your activity is not acceptable. But basically, this was my burden. And religion came along and said, we can release you of this. For me, it happened in the Himalayas. Um, we were smoking a lot of ganja at the time, but this was a dream that wasn't drug fueled. Uh, and that's what hit me about it. Sitting in this room at a table, a bit like a kitchen with lots of wall cabinets. And God came in and looked at me and smiled and then walked up to the first cabinet. And I said, no, 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 don't open that because these were full of skeletons. And he opened the cabinet and looked inside and looked at me and <coughs> smiled. And then he went to the second one and I was like, no, 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 don't do that. And I was squirming in shame. And he basically went round and opened all the cabinets, he, she, and got to the end and looked at me and smiled. And I knew the smile said, I've known this about you all along and I still love you. And that's what undid me, completely undid me, that kind of acceptability in love. And the two things that really struck me about that new relationship, one, I was no longer alone. I was now connected 24 seven with the greatest authority in the universe. <laughs> Sounds crazy, it was great. Um, but I was not alone anymore. I was no longer an insider or an outsider out of place. The second thing was, I was forgiven. All that guilt and shame was done away with. I was free. It was great. And then I met my first Christian. And then I went to my first church. And things started to get <laughs> go bad after that. They weren't all bad by any means. But the subtle thing that happened was that when somebody gets hold of a book and a book of rules and says, you're no longer a sinner, you're a saint. You have to behave as God's people should behave. Your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the world and the nations. You must be a living example of the way to be. You just get shamed again. My sexuality did not find an easy place in Christianity. I couldn't work out what holy sex was. I couldn't see what Jesus' relationship with sexuality was. I did pick up a whole lot of implicit and explicit messages about what should be done and shouldn't be done. And I tried really hard to fit into that box. I prayed, I fasted, I struggled, I strove. I banged on heaven's door. And then I decided, look, God, if you're not going to answer my prayers and you're not interested, neither am I. And I dropped it. And I became a missionary. I went to Africa and <clears throat> I was received by people whose list of sins is slightly different from Westerners. So there's murder at the top and then Westerners tend to have sex. And right at the very bottom, they have anger. Whereas in Tanzania, murder was at the top and then right underneath it, was anger. And right at the bottom was sex. So it was a great relief for me in some ways, although I did have to watch my temper. Um, <laughs> <coughs> the thing is that um, shame can be your friend. Shame can, can teach you when you're you're breaking through your boundaries. The two emotions that are to do with boundaries are anger where somebody else is coming to violate your boundary, 
and shame which is telling you when you're violating your boundary. So for instance, walking down the street and I'm a missionary and I'm going to meet somebody and I walk past this beggar who's lost all his toes and fingers from leprosy and I walk past and a little voice says to me, what about him? And now I can ignore that voice and it will still be there, my conscience, or I can simply turn around and give him a few shillings or say, I'm sorry mate, I've got no change today make the connection and my shame evaporates. It's done its job. I've maintained my integrity. I've maintained my authenticity. I can carry on. So the four things I'd like to suggest to you for a healthy relationship with shame. One, discern where the shame is coming from. There's an awful lot of projected shame. People put shame onto you and some of that is useful to know to know how to behave, to be acceptable in a society. But the way to check it is ask yourself, whose voice is this? Is it your voice? Is it your mother's voice, your father's voice, your vicar's voice, the bishop's voice, your colleague's voice? Then you'll know it's projected, it's not your shame. You can choose that, whether to keep it or dump it. Two, know your core values. I believe um, that everybody is here to live a life that is an example of certain core values that we all need to know and we all need to experience and we need to see them embodied. And if you know your core values, your shame will help you to live a life that is integrated and authentic. Um, I, I would just like to say this, I see a difference between religion, which is man-made, and God, who's in the kitchen, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> My God's a kitchen God, love and acceptance and grace. Um, the third thing is be radically honest with yourself and with others. And the last thing is cultivate a spontaneous life. Try and get back to that freedom of childhood and trust in yourself. Thank you. <laughs>